James Day, public television pioneer and chairman of the CUNY TV Advisory Board, passed away in April 2008. His legacy includes the series Day at Night, which aired for 130 episodes beginning in 1973. The program features interviews with many of the great thinkers and achievers of the 20th century. These 30-year-old programs have been restored. The interviews remain fresh and relevant today, exploring issues that are still important to society. Showing them again is CUNY TV's tribute to Jim and his contributions to public television. Stuart Alsop is the younger of the famous Alsop brothers, both political journalists who singly and together have won the loyalty and respect of millions of readers. It was in a collaborative effort with his brother Joseph that Stuart Alsop first became a columnist. When their collaboration ended in what he terms an amicable divorce after 12 years, he became Washington correspondent for the Saturday Evening Post. Since 1968, his name has appeared above a weekly column of political commentary in Newsweek magazine. He's also the author of two books on politics and the co-author, with his brother, of two others. In 1971, Stuart Alsop was told he had an inoperable and lethal cancer, with little or no chance of surviving a year or two at most. His experience is the subject of his most recent book, Stay of Execution. Some years ago. Mr. Olsop, uh, the, the, the only one thing certain in life, of course, is death. Why is it so terribly shattering, as indeed it is, when you're told that you may die or probably will die, when, when it is so certain? Uh, well, it, I think it's a question of immediacy. We all know that we're going to die one of these days. But it is a shock, or it was a shock to me, and I think would be a shock to most people, to be told that you had a life expectancy of a year or, at the very most, two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, two and a half years ago, which is already beating the odds, <coughs> I was told I had a disease called acute uh, myeloblastic leukemia, which had an average life expectancy of about a year. And uh, since I'd always put the thought of death rather in the back of my mind, for a while this was a shattering piece of information. It would have been, in a sense, disturbing if you'd been told you had a head cold, wouldn't it? Because you've had an extremely healthy life up until the point of... True, the, yes, the until I went to the status. hospital in, in June of 71, uh, I used to... Uh, I used to never get sick. I can remember when I was... <laughs> I commanded a uh, machine gun platoon in Italy for about five weeks, and everybody in the platoon got sick, sick leave except me. Hmm. You know, we were out in the... It's very hard for people who have never been sick to abide other people who are sick, too, isn't true, it? True, true. I've never been sufficiently sympathetic to my wife when she's been sick hmm. or when she's had a baby. <clears throat> but um, you get used to living with this, with this uh, diagnosis. And you do get used to it? Yes, uh, in a way. I think, uh, as I said in my book, uh, Stay of Execution, I, d I think if you were told that you were going to be dead in three hours, you'd spend the whole three hours thinking about uh, this forthcoming death. Mm -hmm. But if you're told that you're going to die uh, in some future indefinite moment, maybe in a year, maybe in two years, it doesn't preoccupy you in the same way, and you get used it's to it. Only because it can't preoccupy you? Uh, you can't go on thinking about nothing but your death for. Uh, 24 mm -hmm. hours a day, or yeah. however long you're awake. And uh, as, as you know, the diagnosis was changed to a more ambiguous one. Nobody, including the doctors at NIH, has any real idea about what my life expectancy is now. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be long. Mm -hmm. But the very ambiguity does offer hope, and hope is absolutely essential, isn't it, Joan? I agree. Mm -hmm. I've had arguments with my uh, previous doctor, Dr. John Glecku, 
took care of me for the first couple of years about this because uh, NIH, you know, believes in a policy of absolute candor. Uh, they hide nothing from the patient. Mm -hmm. And it's always seemed to me that you should be candid with the patient up to a point. You leave him a little yeah. bit of hope. You cite what may very well become Alsep's law in the book, which is tell a patient he may die, will probably die, but not will die. That mm. is, the, the, the absolute certitude. That was the total certitude is, mm. is very hard to live by. Mm. If you have a little opening that by some miracle you will survive, as I have, mm. um, that it makes it very much easier to live with. There's the other, there's the other school, uh, which I think is concentrated particularly in uh, Yale, which is the effect that if you find a um, acute leukemic, you don't tell him he has acute leukemia. <coughs> you tell him only that he has anemia. You give him an occasional boost uh, mm. with the red blood cells. And when, inevitably, he, uh, he gets some disease and dies from it, that's the end, and he hasn't suffered as much the, as he otherwise would. Yeah, the inevitability there makes it uh, desirable then to keep him in ignorance. Yes, you, yeah, you, why, why make him worry? Mm -hmm. Tell him he has a case of anemia. Mm -hmm. um, he'll die within four months maximum without treatment. And uh, <clears throat> since he's going to die anyway, this is the best way to do it. This, mm -hmm. this, is, this is a, it's called the nihilist school. Mm -hmm. I find myself torn between the NIH school and the nihilist I school. See. I was going to ask you what you learned about yourself through this experience. In the book, you've learned a great deal about yourself physiologically. You've become <laughs> almost a practicing physician in the course of, right. of keeping notes and, and questioning doctors. But what have you learned about yourself psychically? You, you said that you had no spiritual experience out of this because you're an agnostic. Yes, I have. Uh, the book was is published by the Literary Guild and also by the Reader's Digest Book Club, uh, so that a lot of people have read it by now. And uh, I have a whole mass of letters, from mostly from ladies, saying that it's uh, you know, more in sorrow than in anger. A terrible disappointment it was to, for them to learn that I was uh, still, after all these experiences, an agnostic. <coughs> agnostic, after all, doesn't say there is not a god. He says, I don't know whether there is or not. And uh, you do get a feeling of uh, something mysterious out there, some forces that uh, the most brilliant doctors or the wisest scientists are never going to be able precisely to define. But uh, I stubbornly remain an agnostic. Stubbornly? Stubbornly. You've indicated in your book that um, the uh, possibility of death for reasons which I guess are not explained caused you to have an increased interest in your ancestors and your ancestry. <laughs> well, I suppose. Actually, they, what first gave me an interest in my ancestors and my ancestry was an article I wrote for the Saturday Evening Post which in its dying days was, was trying to get back to the kind of the old post. Yeah. They did a series about families, and I had never paid much attention to my family. You know, there were uh, one dozen, uh, except that my ancestors must all have been very vain, because every damn one of them on both sides had their uh, portraits painted, so we were always surrounded by portraits of the, the ancestors. And, the and I found it, having the I pictures found it taken in profile also, I noticed. Oh, yes, and from the back. From the back. <laughs> Those were photographs. But uh, I became absolutely fascinated by my ancestors. They were such an odd lot of people. For one thing, I discovered that no Alsop, and in fact up to Theodore Roosevelt, none on my mother's side of, the, of, the, uh, of my family tree, had ever fought in a war. They, uh, Theodore my, Roosevelt was your mother's uncle. Was my it? mother's uncle, that's yes. right. And his father, who was my great-grandfather, 
um, adopted a kind of elegant draft dodge during the Civil War in which he was a member of the Sanitation Committee. And my Osap ancestor at the same period bought another man to go in his place. Same thing happened back in the Revolutionary War. So I, I discovered that we were not a very, very martial family. <laughs> which was not reflected in your own life, incidentally, since you oh, had some, and write about some considerable war experiences, which I want to ask you about later. But I wanted to ask you first about your father and your mother. You said your feelings towards your father were ambivalent because he was something of a, of a rigid disciplinarian, I suppose, with respect to, to uh, the children in the family. Uh, yeah, Pa was a kind of an old-fashioned type. And uh, Joe and Connecticut Yankee, Connecticut Yankee type. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my my brother, older brother Joe and I were passionate, uh, rather left-wing New Dealers in the old days. I suppose, in a way, we still are. Mm -hmm. Events have caught up with us. Whereas he was uh, equally passionately anti-New Deal, and he used to occasionally, when he got too angry at us, he would, uh, you know, he'd burst out and say, "Well, why don't you go back to Russia if you prefer it there?" <laughs> <laughs> sort of argument, <laughs> and uh, uh, but we had we never what, came what to blows. Made, yes, what made you and your brother? Uh, perhaps I should ask you to speak for yourself and your brother to speak for himself. Made you l passionate new dealers coming out of uh, the heritage you did? Was it simply perversity, uh, 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 a desire to stand up to your own father in this case? Or a matter of and mother. Mother was an even more passionate anti-New Dealer, oh, although she was a cousin of the Roosevelt's. Uh, well, I suppose it was partly a youthful revolt, which is a phenomenon we've seen a good deal of lately. Yeah. But I think, I still believe, that it was uh, simply a correct analysis of the existing situation. Mm -hmm. After all, when I went to college, a quarter of the working population were unemployed. Uh, and you, instead of uh, instead of having uh, federal and state uh, programs to make sure that people uh, had enough to eat, uh, they were dependent, the unemployed and the poor, on Lady Bountiful. And it seemed to me, and it still seems to me, that in the richest country in the world, this was an intolerable situation. Mm -hmm. This made me a New Dealer. You came uh, out of, uh, in your own education, a kind of uh, class of privilege, I suppose, Groton, uh, which, as you say in your book, was uh, a school that turned out people like Dean Acheson and others who were aristocratic. Franklin Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt. Anglophiles. Miles, Whitney. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, Groton was for the sons of the establishment rich. We weren't rich, but we... Uh, but you were establishment? <laughs> I guess we were establishment. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh, but, you know, in a curious way, Groton produced a lot of left-wing types, too. Mm -hmm. Partly through the same syndrome. After all, Franklin Roosevelt went to Groton. That's right. Um, so did many uh, liberals. Dean Acheson, um, Averill Harriman, who's still in his 80s, uh, mm -hmm. leading light of the left wing of the Democratic Party. So that uh, that stamp that a school or a family puts on you doesn't necessarily hold. Mm -hmm. <coughs> What of your mother? You spoke of her as being even more passionately anti-New Deal, and in the book you, you tell the story of her calling upon Franklin Roosevelt a couple of times. I gather she had a lot of nerve in phoning up the president and asking to see him. She had know. a lot of brass. She always yeah. did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she seconded uh, Landon's nomination in 1936 at the Republican Convention being introduced, of course, as a cousin of the Roosevelt's. And within a matter of, uh, then we went to the um, second inauguration of the president, and the mother was completely unembarrassed by the fact that she <laughs> made speeches all over the place denouncing Franklin Roosevelt and all his works. And indeed, they had a certain affection for each other. Mm. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was very much a kind of a family man. Yeah, you know, he loved to talk to his cousin, Corrine, particularly, I think, because she had enough brass to make fun of him. You know, oh, right? he she liked that. Yeah, he kind of enjoyed it, mm -hmm. up to a point. I see. And she had no hesitation to go to him and ask favors of him. <coughs> None whatever. On the, the behalf of her children. No, she, uh, she went for both Joe and myself. Joe was captured by the Japs, and she wanted to be sure that he was repatriated. 
I was in the British Army and had been refused uh, uh, transfer to the American Army. And so she went and pulled that big string, and finally I was transferred. Why did you join the British Army? This was before Pearl, before Pearl Harbor, was it not? Yeah, I volunteered before Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. I actually got to, uh, to England well after Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. about April of 42. Uh, Why were you anxious to go into the war? Well, I'd been turned down by the draft, and I tried to get into the Navy, and uh, I kept getting turned down. I've, I've always had a slight asthma problem and a high blood pressure problem, although I was, as I say, perfectly mm -hmm. healthy. And um, they turned me down, and I found, you know, you're affected, I think, by your colleagues, by your, what is the word, your contemporaries. Peers. Huh? They were all <laughs> peers, yeah. Mm -hmm. They were all uh, showing up in pretty uniforms and going off to romantic places, and there was, was I in New York working for Double A Donut. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I decided to, I heard that the uh, British were taking in a limited number of, uh, of uh, volunteers. So I went to the British Embassy, and I was referred to a major, must have been about six feet six, with a huge drooping mustache. And I allowed us how I wanted to get into the British Army, and he said, oh, it's all right. He said, uh, I, I said, I must tell you in frankness that I've been turned down by the American services. And he said, oh, eyes all right? <laughs> I said, eyes all he, all he cared about. Uh, eyes all right? And mm -hmm. I said, yes, sir, I got 20-20 vision. I said, don't worry about the thing. It, well, it, well, be sure of one thing, he said. Be sure to bring over uh, a good shotgun for the grouse shooting in the autumn, and a runabout so that you can get up <laughs> to, the, to the north of Scotland. And don't forget your dinner jacket, he says. He hadn't been in England since before the war started, so he had a picture of uh, England at war, which, alas, turned out to be totally you had, inaccurate. You, you had no use for these, uh, I suspect. None. Huh? Well, the, the pistol came in. He said he also to bring my personal weapon, and I, I brought a forty-five that my father had, and that turned out to be useful. Hmm. <coughs> you write in the book of the other experience that you had when you came close to death, this time with the OSS. You're now transferred to the American forces and dropped mm -hmm. into France. That's right. Well, that was more an amusing experience than anything else. Uh, uh, I was in an outfit called the Judbergs, and the Judbergs consisted of an American or Englishman and a Frenchman and a radio, uh, you know, a man who, to get the secret mm -hmm. messages back and forth. And I was number one in this shoot that was going over trying to find our DZ, our drop zone, as it's mm -hmm. called in, in France. And the pilot obviously got lost. And there was a little man, um, RAF sergeant, who'd never done any, any command of uh, dropping mm -hmm. before. So he said, the chaps, I don't know anything about this. Uh, when you see a light, jump. And I was number one in the string with my legs dangling in the mm -hmm. French air. And I later learned that he scrabbled about to light a cigarette. <laughs> and that was the light. That was the light. I mm -hmm. saw the light. I was mm -hmm. nervous as hell. Pushed myself off. And he stopped the rest of the string. So there I was absolutely all alone. Over-occupied friends. Occupied friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, I crouched behind a bush, and I lit my cigarette. I had only 20. I remember saying, I had 19 left. Mm. And I had a slug of, of uh, issue British brandy. And I said to myself, Ossop, you're in trouble. And mm. indeed, I was. Yes. And I recalled uh, this incident, this moment, when I discovered that I had AML realized I was in trouble once again, mm -hmm. but that as on that occasion, I might be able to come out of it somehow. Yes. You say, uh, you, you write of your war experiences in the book that deals largely with the, the uh, leukemia, uh, and say that the, for some reason that the, uh, uh, the war seems to mean, mean more to you now in retrospect. Yeah, I was surprised by how much I wrote about the war. Mm -hmm. Uh, partly because it, my war was an odd one, and it amused me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got married in England. Uh, my wife is English. But it did surprise me how much I'd been 
influenced by having been in a war. Oh, I'm I glad didn't. none of my children have been in, but they nevertheless have missed something. Mm -hmm. Is it because you learned something about yourself in this war? I think so, yes. Mm. I think there's a... Uh, mind you, it makes me sound like a, a leading warrior, but there is something to be said for facing the possibility of death when you're young mm. and finding out what your own reaction is and finding out what kind of a guy you are. Mm. And we all fear our reaction to death, do we not? And it's, you, when you say it's important, perhaps when you're young, to find out how you will react, we all fear we may react the wrong way, I suppose, don't we? That's think? right. Mm. I think the word is phobophobia, fear is of fear. Mm. You've said that uh, while you described yourself as a young man, as a Marxist liberal, and then later as a leftist, leftish liberal, that uh, as your, your blood becomes more watery, as you put it, you seem to become more conservative. Is there a shifting of priorities, either as you grow older or as you become more conscious of the possibility of an end of life? I, I'm not aware of it. I, I, I'm not aware of having changed my views. Mm. In a way, it seems to Everybody me... Everybody else has changed theirs, I suppose. That's it. Mm -hmm. The Democratic Party with which I was brought up was the party of Roosevelt and Kennedy. It was the party of uh, internationalism, of intervention, of uh, a powerful defense. Uh, Kennedy, after all, ran against Nixon in 1960 largely on the basis of an inadequate defense. Um, the... the... Democratic Party of George McGovern is essentially an isolationist party. Uh, many of the things that George McGovern stands for were the same things that, uh, that Bob Taft stood for. America mm -hmm. First, uh, <coughs> the um, Fortress America, all that. So that in a way, I think the Liberal Democrats have moved away from me rather than me from them. I say. Uh, but that's an old illusion. I think in my book I also tell about how my father got furious because he was holding forth at the dinner table about his political views, and I interrupted to say, Pa, how could you get to be so reactionary? And he got purple in the face and said that he'd run on the progressive ticket in 1912 and he hadn't changed his views one iota. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that he'd always been a progressive. And so one's, one's uh, self-perception politically yes. can be a little um, distorted by the time element, I think. Have your experiences in these past two years caused you to change your, 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 your priority of values in any way? Do you think certain things are more important that you thought were less important, uh, say, four or five years ago? I think I do. I worry less about uh, the column, about making deadlines, about perhaps as a result my column has, in Newsweek has deteriorated. But if, you're, uh, if you have that Damocles sword hanging over you, the small things of life don't bother you as much as they used to. Uh, and the, I think it's also true that the beautiful things of life uh, particularly please you. I'm looking forward to this Washington Spring, hmm. which it looked for a the, while. The natural, the natural beauty. When you see, speak of the beautiful things in life, the things that all of us have available to us, if That's we right. will but notice them. I've always thought the Washington Spring was the most beautiful of all springs, hmm. and uh, I can't wait for it. Hmm. What about children? Attitude toward your own children, for example, has that been altered at all? You speak in the book of of the strong ties you have to the children. And the fact that you've perhaps treated them a little differently than your father did you, been a bit I've, I've been very permissive, but mm -hmm. I think this was this predated my uh, diagnosis. I see. Mm -hmm. And that I'd say easier to leave things up to my wife, mm -hmm. who is uh, more of a disciplinarian. I see. What about your attitude toward your own children now? Is it? Well, I have a profound affection for my children. Mm -hmm. As I say in my book, I think that there is a danger. Uh, in the relationship between parents and children, uh, particularly 
mothers and sons, as uh, Dr. Freud used to point out, if you get too emotionally tied up with your children, uh, this can hurt your children. And I think a certain genial indifference hmm. uh, or affectionate indifference, if you will, is a proper attitude, particularly after they get to be 18 or 20. I believe in getting the children out of the nest, putting those little birds in the <laughs> on the ground to flutter for themselves. Mm -hmm. I like the phrase you used in the book that they children should be friends who lead their own lives. That's right. As they lead their own lives, become even greater friends, I suspect. And uh, have every right to their own privacy mm -hmm. and to make their own decisions after a reasonable age. Mm -hmm. uh, they're separate people. I've seen too many families which, uh, in which the children are uh, part of the parents. Mm. And this is very dangerous psychologically, in my opinion. Mm. Where, what what uh, resources do you draw upon for your own continued hope? Because hope is, is very important. Well, I think I, I draw in part from the fact that since I was sick this autumn, and I was very sick this autumn, my blood has taken a mysterious turn for the better. It's uh, better than it's been in two years. Mm -hmm. I have more glorious things called granulocytes, which are the cells in your blood. And this is not the disease. consequence of anything having been done to you? No one understands it. Uh, so you can take hope in the, in the, in the sheer mystery of it? Yeah, there's some, uh, there are a lot of things that doctors don't know. Well, this is one of the things that you discover when you're very sick. Uh, for example, the last uh, pneumonia I had, I had two pneumonias. The last pneumonia was, uh, uh, was very rough because you have to have a diagnosis of what kind of pneumonia you have in order to, be a, to have it treated mm -hmm. by um, uh, antibiotics. Mm -hmm. They couldn't diagnose this pneumonia. They finally cut off my left uh, chest here and opened it up to have a look at the lung and snipped off a piece of the lung about as big as your thumb to get to examine it and they still couldn't find out what kind of pneumonia it was and so my wife was given the prognosis that uh, was very grim and then suddenly about four days after this uh, examination uh, after this mm -hmm. operation uh, everything began to get better. So that's where hope and I'd lies. And I asked the doctors right? uh, why, and they said, we don't know. So the mystery is the, is the hope. Thank that's you right. very much. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>